Chapter 17 of The Gods of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Gods of Mars. Chapter 17 The Death Sentence. A few moments before the appointed time on the following morning, a strong guard of Zat Aris officers appeared at our quarters to conduct us to the great hall of the temple. In twos we entered the chamber, and marched down the broad Isle of Hope, as it is called, to the platform in the center of the hall. Before and behind us marched armed guards, while three solid ranks of Zaudangan soldiery lined either side of the aisle from the entrance to the rostrum. As we reached the raised enclosure I saw our judges. As is the custom upon Barsoom, there were thirty-one, supposedly selected by lot from the men of the noble class, for nobles were on trial. But to my amazement I saw no single friendly face among them. Practically all were Zodangans, and it was I to whom Zodanga owed her defeat at the hands of the green hordes and her subsequent vassalage to Helium. There could be little justice here for John Carter, or his son, or for the great Thark who had commanded the savage tribesmen who overran Zodanga's broad avenues, looting, burning, and murdering. About us the vast circular Colosseum was packed to its full capacity. All classes were represented, all ages and both sexes. As we entered the hall the hum of subdued conversation ceased until, as we halted upon the platform, or throne of righteousness, the silence of death enveloped the ten thousand spectators. The judges were seated in a great circle about the periphery of the circular platform. We were assigned seats with our backs toward a small platform in the exact center of the larger one. This placed us facing the judges and the audience. Upon the smaller platform each would take his place while his case was being heard. Zat Aris himself sat in the golden chair of the presiding magistrate. As we were seated and our guards retired to the foot of the stairway leading to the platform, he arose and called my name. "'John Carter!' he cried. "'Take your place upon the pedestal of truth, to be judged impartially according to your acts, and here to know the reward you have earned thereby.' Then, turning to and fro toward the audience, he narrated the acts upon the value of which my reward was to be determined. "'Know you, O judges and people of Helium,' he said, "'that John Carter, one time Prince of Helium, has returned by his own statement from the valley door, and even from the temple of Issus itself, that in the presence of many men of Helium he has blasphemed against the sacred Is, and against the valley door, and the lost sea of Chorus, and the holy therns themselves, and even against Issus, goddess of death and of life eternal. And know you further, by witness of thine own eyes, that see him here now upon the pedestal of truth, that he has indeed returned from these sacred precincts in the face of our ancient customs, and in violation of the sanctity of our ancient religion. He who be once dead may not live again. He who attempts it must be made dead for ever. Judges, your duty lies plain before you. Here can be no testimony in contravention of truth. What reward shall be meted to John Carter in the accordance with the acts he has committed? Death! shouted one of the judges. And then a man sprang to his feet in the audience, and raising his hand on high, cried, Justice! 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 It was Kanto's Khan and as all eyes turned toward him he leapt past the Zodangan soldiery and sprang upon the platform. "'What manner of justice be this?' he cried to Zadaris. "'The defendant has not been heard, nor has he had an opportunity to call others in his behalf. In the name of the people of Helium I demand fair and impartial treatment for the Prince of Helium.' A great cry arose from the audience then. Justice! 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 And Zadaris dared not deny them. Speak, then, he snarled, turning to me, but blaspheme not against the things that are sacred upon Barsoom. Men of Helium, I cried, turning to the spectators and speaking over the heads of my judges, 
How can John Carter expect justice from the men of Zodanga? He cannot, nor does he ask it. It is to the men of Helium that he states his case, nor does he appeal for mercy to any. It is not in his own cause that he speaks now, it is in thine. In the cause of your wives and daughters, and of wives and daughters yet unborn, it is to save them from the unthinkably atrocious indignities that I have seen heaped upon the fair women of Barsoom in the place men call the Temple of Issus. It is to save them from the sucking embrace of the plant-men, from the fangs of the great white apes of Dor, from the cruel lust of the holy therns, from all that the cold, dead Is carries them to from homes of love and life and happiness. Sits there no man here who does not know the history of John Carter, how he came among you from another world, and rose from a prisoner among the green men, through torture and persecution, to a place high among the highest of Barsoom. Nor ever did you know John Carter to lie in his own behalf, or to say aught that might harm the people of Barsoom, or to speak lightly of the strange religion which he respected without understanding. There be no man here or elsewhere upon Barsoom today who does not owe his life directly to a single act of mine, in which I sacrificed myself and the happiness of my princess that you might live. And so, men of Helium, I think that I have the right to demand that I be heard, that I be believed, and that you let me serve you and save you from the false hereafter of Dor and Issus, as I saved you from the real death that other day. It is to you of Helium that I speak now. When I am done, let the men of Zodanga have their will with me. Zad Aris has taken my sword from me, so the men of Zodanga no longer fear me. Will you listen? Speak, John Carter, Prince of Helium, cried a great noble from the audience, and the multitude echoed his permission, until the building rocked with the noise of their demonstration. Zat Aris knew better than to interfere with such a sentiment as was expressed that day in the Temple of Reward, and so for two hours I talked with the people of Helium. But when I had finished, Zat Aris arose and, turning to the judges, said in a low tone, My nobles, you have heard John Carter's plea. Every opportunity has been given him to prove his innocence, if he be not guilty. But instead, he has but utilized the time in further blasphemy. What, gentlemen, is your verdict? "'Death to the blasphemer!' cried one, springing to his feet, and in an instant the entire thirty-one judges were on their feet with upraised swords in token of the unanimity of their verdict. If the people did not hear Zadara's charge, they certainly did hear the verdict of the tribunal." a sullen murmur rose louder and louder about the packed Colosseum. And then, Canto Scan, who had not left the platform since first he had taken his place near me, raised his hand for silence. When he could be heard, he spoke to the people in a cool and level voice. "'You have heard the fate that the men of Zodanga would meet to Helium's noblest hero. It may be the duty of the men of Helium to accept the verdict as final.' Let each man act according to his own heart. Here is the answer of Cantos Khan, head of the navy of Helium, to Zat Aris and his judges. And with that he unbuckled his scabbard and threw his sword at my feet. In an instant, soldiers and citizens, officers and nobles, were crowding past the soldiers of Zodanga and forcing their way to the throne of righteousness. A hundred men surged upon the platform and a hundred blades rattled and clanked to the floor at my feet. Zat Aris and his officers were furious, but they were helpless. One by one I raised the swords to my lips and buckled them again upon their owners. "'Come,' said Kantos Khan, "'we will escort John Carter and his party to his own palace.' And they formed about us and started toward the stairs leading to the Isle of Hope. "'Stop!' cried Zat Aris. Soldiers of Helium, let no prisoners leave the throne of righteousness. The soldiery from Zodanga were the only organized body of Heliometic troops within the temple, so Zadaris was confident that his orders would be obeyed, 
but I do not think that he looked for the opposition that was raised the moment the soldiers advanced toward the throne. From every quarter of the Colosseum swords flashed and men rushed threatening upon the Zodangans. Someone raised a cry. Tardos Moors is dead! A thousand years to John Carter, Jeddak of Helium! As I heard that and saw the ugly attitude of the men of Helium toward the soldiers of Zat Aris, I knew that only a miracle could avert a clash that would end in civil war. "'Hold!' I cried, leaping to the pedestal of truth once more. "'Let no man move till I am done. A single sword thrust here today may plunge Helium into a bitter and bloody war, the results of which none can foresee. It will turn brother against brother and father against son. No man's life is worth that sacrifice.' Rather would I submit to the biased judgment of Zadaris than be the cause of civil strife in Helium. Let us each give in a point to the other, and let this entire matter rest until Tardos Mors returns, or Mors Kajak, his son. If neither be back at the end of a year, a second trial may be held. The thing has a precedent. And then, turning to Zadaris, I said in a low voice, Unless you be a bigger fool than I take you to be, you will grasp the chance I am offering you ere it is too late. Once that multitude of swords below is drawn against your soldiery, no man upon Barsoom, not even Tardos Mors himself, can avert the consequences. What say you? Speak quickly. The jet of Zodangan Helium raised his voice to the angry sea beneath us. Stay your hands, men of Helium! he shouted, his voice trembling with rage. The sentence of the court is passed, but the day of retribution has not been set. I, Zat Aris, Jed of Zodanga, appreciating the royal connections of the prisoner and his past services to Helium and Barsoom, grant a respite of one year, or until the return of Mors Kajak or Tordos Mors to Helium. Disperse quietly to your houses. Go. No one moved. Instead, they stood in tense silence, with their faces fastened upon me, as though waiting for a signal to attack. "'Clear the temple,' commanded Zat Aris in a low tone to one of his officers. Fearing the result of an attempt to carry out this order by force, I stepped to the edge of the platform and, pointing toward the main entrance, bid them pass out. As one man they turned at my request and filed— silent and threatening, passed the soldiers of Zad Aris, Jed of Zodanga, who stood scowling in impotent rage. Kantos Khan, with the others who had sworn allegiance to me, still stood upon the throne of righteousness with me. "'Come,' said Kantos Khan to me, "'we will escort you to your palace, my prince. Come, Carthoris and Zodar, come, Tars Tarkas and with a haughty sneer for Zat Aris upon his handsome lips, he turned and strode to the throne steps and up the Isle of Hope. We four and the hundred loyal ones followed behind him. Nor was a hand raised to stay us, though glowering eyes followed our triumphal march through the temple. In the avenues we found a press of people, but they opened a pathway for us, and many were the swords that were flung at my feet as I passed through the city of Helium toward my palace upon the outskirts. Here my old slaves fell upon their knees and kissed my hands as I greeted them. They cared not where I had been. It was enough that I had returned to them. "'Ah, oh, master!' cried one. "'If our divine princess were but here, this would be a day indeed!' Tears came to my eyes, so that I was forced to turn away that I might hide my emotions. Carthoris wept openly as the slaves pressed about him with expressions of affection and words of sorrow for our common loss. It was now that Tars Tarkas for the first time learned that his daughter, Sola, had accompanied Dejah Thoris upon the last long pilgrimage. I had not the heart to tell him what Kantos Khan had told me. With the stoicism of the green Martian, he showed no sign of suffering, yet I knew that his grief was as poignant as my own. In marked contrast to his kind, he had in well-developed form the kindlier human characteristics of love, friendship, and charity. 
It was a sad and somber party that sat at the feast of welcome in the great dining hall of the palace of the Prince of Helium that day. We were over a hundred strong, not counting the members of my little court, for Dejah Thoris and I had maintained a household consistent with our royal rank. The board, according to Red Martian custom, was triangular, for there were three in our family. Carthoris and I presided in the center of our sides of the table. Midway of the third side, Dejah Thoris' high-backed carven chair stood vacant except for her gorgeous wedding trappings and jewels, which were draped upon it. Behind stood a slave, as in the days when his mistress had occupied her place at the board, ready to do her bidding. It was the way upon Barsoom, so I endured the anguish of it, though it wrung my heart to see that silent chair, where should have been my laughing and vivacious princess, keeping the great hall ringing with her merry gaiety. At my right sat Cantos Khan, while to the right of Dejah Thoris' empty place Tars Tarkas sat in a huge chair before a raised section of the board which years ago I had had constructed to meet the requirements of his mighty bulk. The place of honor at a Martian board is always at the hostess's right, and this place was ever reserved by Dejah Thoris for the great Thark upon the occasions that he was in Helium. Horvastus sat in the seat of honor upon Carthoris' side of the table. There was little general conversation. It was a quiet and saddened party. The loss of Dejah Thoris was still fresh in the minds of all, and to this was added fear for the safety of Tardos Mors and Mors Kajak, as well as doubt and uncertainty as to the fate of Helium, should it prove true that she was permanently deprived of her great Jeddak. Suddenly our attention was attracted by the sound of distant shouting, as of many people raising their voices at once, but whether in anger or rejoicing we could not tell. Nearer and nearer came the tumult. A slave rushed into the dining hall to cry that a great concourse of people was swarming through the palace gates. A second burst upon the heels of the first, alternately laughing and shrieking as a madman. Deja Thoris is found! he cried, a messenger from Dejah Thoris. I waited to hear no more. The great windows of the dining hall overlooked the avenue leading to the main gates. They were upon the opposite side of the hall from me in the table intervening. I did not waste time in circling the great board. With a single leap I cleared table and diners and sprang upon the balcony beyond. Thirty feet below lay the scarlet sward of the lawn, and beyond were many people crowding about a great throat, which bore a rider headed toward the palace. I vaulted to the ground below and ran swiftly toward the advancing party. As I came near to them, I saw that the figure on the throat was Sola. "'Where is the Princess of Helium?' I cried. The green girl slid from her mighty mount and ran toward me. Oh, my prince, my prince, she cried, she is gone for ever. Even now she may be a captive upon the lesser moon. The black pirates of Barsoom have stolen her. End of chapter 17